Well, it's 43 days to the 32nd Olympic Games that will happen in Tokyo and 74 days to the 16th Paralympic Games that will also happen in Tokyo this summer. And it's coming up. And this week, we continue in the new book I've written called Rules of the Jungle. These are not rules of the road because everybody knows the rules of the road they're on. And they pretty well know what they have to do and when they have to do it. But rules of the jungle are when unexpected things happen, things that you didn't anticipate, like COVID-19. How we can learn to be the best of the best of the best from Olympians and Paralympians. And last week, we dealt with the meaning of success. And this week, we're talking about how to grow properly and what to do when you're faced with confrontation. I'm Jungle Jim Hunter, and you're listening to 831 Living Your Best Life podcast, where we inspire participation, communicate precision, and empower performers to podium. And we hope you'll tell your friends and relatives and people you work with to go to their favorite podcast provider or go to junglejimhunter.com or to YouTube and subscribe, download, click on like, rate and review us and become an 831-er, somebody that makes a difference in other people's lives because we've inspired through you listening to 831 and you want to be someone who makes a difference in other people's lives. Well, the rules of the jungle are how you deal with unexpected things and changes and how you manage yourself in the heat of the moment. Our athletes getting ready for Tokyo must narrow their focus because if they have prepared right, all the hard work is pretty well done. There's not much time to change anything. It's all fine-tuning. It's time to celebrate their preparations and review all the what-ifs and know what you're going to do if everything goes right and you have to anticipate what you will do if some things go wrong. Therefore, you have an unbelievably confident approach to what you're doing, and you hope and believe you will be ready. However, when and if things go wrong, what and who will respond the right way? How do you respond when things go the wrong way for you? Prior to the games a few years ago, I was asked to work with a team and prepare them properly, and I wanted to see if they would come together. And so on the way to a practice where it was really not something that mattered, but it was part of what we had to do for the day, we made sure that the bus broke down. We wanted to see how all the athletes responded. Did the captain step forward? Did the assistant captain step forward? Did the leadership come from those people that our team looks up to? And amazingly enough, they all came together and they became a team and bonded for the first time because they had to find a solution and find a way to get to practice and get there on time and still be able to have a full practice. The coaches were stepping back. We had on purpose made sure that they weren't on the bus so that the athletes would have to do it. You're on the road and you meet a challenge and you're faced with a confrontation. And this happens to us every day. It happens to us multiple times every day. You follow the seven steps in confrontation and you realize you need to go to the second step, which is to deconstruct what you did before because it isn't working. And so you follow those steps and now it is time to go to the third step, the third phase. You go to reconstruction. This is how you're prepared to do your best when called upon to do so. Your deck is falling apart. You need a new one. You have to totally deconstruct it. You've got to remove everything. You've got to prepare whatever you need to prepare. And you've got to have a plan. And then you start. And you always build in contingencies. You always build in what happens if it rains. What happens if the weather doesn't? What happens if? And the what happens if happen all the time. These are the rules of the jungle. During the 76 Olympics, I was on my final practice run in the morning of the race in an enclosed private area the race organizing committee had put there for every racer to do their last warm-up run. I came off a bump near the bottom of the course, and a photographer was running across the practice course to get to the race course, and I was airborne at about 70 miles an hour, and there's no way I could change directions. Somebody yelled. The photographer stopped because somebody yelled, and I hit him. Yeah. And this is literally an hour before I'm about to race. I was injured. I tore my downhill suit. I ripped the strap off my helmet. I broke my goggles and my poles. And my race skis were shattered and broken. And, you know, that was normal. You ran your race skis in the last run before you got on the course because you wanted to know if they felt right and if everything was right. 
The photographer got up and he was okay. But I was injured. I didn't want to tell anybody. I didn't want to talk about it. And there was panic by everyone around me. And when I got back to the top of the hill, people were scrambling, going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I said, calm down. And I went to my knapsack and in there I had backup. I had everything covered, everything backed up so that I knew that no matter what happened, I knew what I was going to do if such a thing like this would ever happen. Was I planning for it to happen? No, but I was prepared in case it did. I got in the course, barely could put my poles in the starting one because I was still shaking and the adrenaline rush had gone through me, and I wondered how I was even going to get down the course, but I'd even prepared for that and knew what I was going to do and how I was going to focus. And I raced and had my best Olympic downhill run, improving on my 72 performance four years earlier. But that evening, when we went to Canada House to celebrate the race and celebrate how Canada did in other events in the Olympics, as well as our own, they replayed the downhill. And the amazing thing is the announcers on the television, on our Canadian broadcasting, were making the comment that because I didn't win, that somehow I should look for greener pastures. And maybe it was time for me to move on. Because at 23, I was so old, and yet no one knew what I had gone through. No one had discussed it. No one was aware. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> you see, in the third part of the clover leaf, you want to improve upon what you were doing before, so you stick to the seven components in this phase. Number one, you build a better foundation. You had a foundation. It wasn't working, so you change that. And you want to build better than you did before. So second, you must face the truth of what was and what it has to become. Third, it's so easy to look at what has happened and be comfortable with where you were and want to stay there. So you have to seek those who will make you, number three, accountable. So there's no going back to being comfortable. How many times have you started something new and made a mistake and had to do something over? We all have to. So therefore, you have to give yourself a lot of grace, which is number four. You have to be nice to yourself. Most of the time, people that are in trouble in confrontation are never nice to themselves, let alone to others. Allow for that, but do not accept mistakes and miscalculations as an acceptable path you can go down and therefore start to make excuses. Every excuse is an abuse. Every time you make an excuse, you abuse yourself. Why would you do that? Don't you like yourself? Wow. You make needed changes and therefore new adjustments, which is number five. And if you make a mistake, this is good because knowing you fixed it and had time to relearn and do the right thing, you allowed for it. Therefore, doing so frees you up to know you have a plan of action. And thus, the next step, the sixth step, is empowerment. You know that you have the ability to change and grow. You will be empowered to press on because you know you're growing and knowing you can change. Finally, your words and actions will be encouragement. You see, the leaders step up and encourage and find ways to find solutions without ever making anybody else feel like they're not pulling their weight. As a matter of fact, they look for those that aren't to give them an opportunity to show that they can pull their weight. My mom would say in her letters to me as I traveled around the world, when you fail, you now know what not to do, so celebrate failure, because failure is giving you what you need to know. My parents did not know if I would ever make it as a ski racer to the expected level I had set for myself. They had no knowledge about the sport, so had to trust me to tell them my plans and what I was doing. My dad would say, you're the one going up and down the mountain, so if you don't know what you're doing, how do you expect me to know? What I am amazed at today is after training thousands of kids and people, I have not met anyone that knows what they should be doing if they run into a confrontation and they don't know how to teach them, how to deal with it, how to manage it. It's like they have no power to do it. There is no way to deal with the confrontation and then how you deconstruct what they know and you know and they have to change and then how to reconstruct it to build better and better performances. It's always, well, this is the way it's always been, so this is the way we do it. 
The performer has to be the student and the coach because in the end, they are the performer in the arena of challenge. My quote for the day, if you're not willing to test yourself to know what you will do, how will you know what to do when you are tested? You need to know. You need to test yourself on purpose. I was tested in the arena of competition 160 times before I made the national team, then an additional 141 times after I made the national team until I achieved my podium position at the Olympic Games in 1972. If we are honest, I failed 310 times with about three dozen victories at lower levels of racing, not at the level I was at. So I did have victories, but they were easier races to win. But each of those taught me how to be prepared for the next level. What kept me going and motivated me was the fact that at each step I was building a foundation I could stand on, pushing me closer to being better and better in performances. By the 1975-76 season, I had my best season on World Cup and was moving in the right direction. The question we have to ask is, am I improving and growing or making another lap around the same confrontation? Now, I don't blame the reporters for saying what they said. It makes good copy. It makes good story. It makes people think about it. But if you don't know what someone is going through, you don't know what they've actually overcome. The actor that fails on the stage and gets back up and re-performs what they were supposed to do gets applauded. The singer that forgets their lines is applauded. The child that forgets what piece they're playing in front of the whole school gets applauded if they try again. Confrontations are inevitable. They are unavoidable. They are also unpredictable. However, if you are willing to face them, they are invaluable because they are controllable giving you the confidence to perform at your best because they are manageable. The most often quoted statement I have ever heard over the years of working with people is the words, I can't. And then whatever thing they think they can't confront. This is sad because it means no one taught them and they don't know how to have the power to grow. You do. You can confront, you can deconstruct, and you can reconstruct. I want to thank you for listening today. I know these are challenging communications, and I'm pushing your buttons, and I'm pushing you, but I hope you will have grown and will be living your best life the next time we meet. Tomorrow, we'll continue on to the fourth aspect of the Cloverleaf and the rules of the jungle.